autodefensas. This is Marina Cordova and Julia Graf. Marina was one of nearly two million people displaced by the ravages of war in Colombia. Julia works for Witness for Peace, where she is currently on assignment in Bogota, Colombia. Witness for Peace is a politically independent, nonprofit grassroots organization committed to nonviolence. Their mission is to support peace, justice, and sustainable economies in the Americas. Marina's tour of the United States to publicize the plight of his people was sponsored by Witness for Peace. Julie agreed to act as Marino's translator on his tour of the Southwest. I love Colombia, I love Bogota, it's a great city. It's a great place to live, but it is also dangerous and it implies risks. And anyone who works um, in the defense of human rights or in, for justice in these countries is an obvious target. Probably Colombians are more targets than we are. But yeah, anyone that comes down on a Witness for Peace delegation, and especially the international team members who live and work there, we know that we're assuming great risks. And we know that we're putting, in some cases, putting our lives on the line. But so are US soldiers when they go abroad, and nobody thinks they're crazy. It's just the mentality that we have in our country that it's okay to risk your life for war, but if you go risk your life for peace, people think you're nuts. Each one of us, before we, go, before we go down, we write a letter to our family or loved ones in case of kidnapping, in case of death. And we know that that's always a possibility, but we feel like the work is really important and no one else is doing it. Cordova was born and raised in Rio Sucio in the Department of Choco, Colombia. At one time, life for the descendants of African slaves in Colombia was a tranquil experience. After gaining freedom from slavery, most of these people lived good lives for generations on the Pacific coast. They farmed and built homes on the land. However, they did not have legal title to their land. In 1993, through the persistent work of community organizers such as Marina Cordova, a law passed to grant Afro-Colombianos title for legal possession of this land. Sadly, soon after the titles were given, right-wing paramilitary death squads arrived to displace the new landowners through a process of fear and assassination. In the middle of a December night in 1996, the paramilitary arrived in Marina Cordova's town with a list of names of human rights workers and community organizers. They went on a house-to-house -house hunt for their victims. Bueno, Colombia is a country that so Colombia is located in South America and has a total population of 40 million people. The Afro-Colombian population is 26% of that total, or approximately 12 million people. Yeah. 
and we're principally located on the Pacific coast of Colombia, and historically we've shared that region with the indigenous peoples as well. And the places that we've lived have traditionally been the poorest and the most marginalized regions of the country, and the, and the countries most abandoned by the state. But thanks to the struggles that we've undertaken and, st and thanks to the unity that we've shown, we've been able to keep our hope alive. My community is located on the banks of a river called the Atrato River in that department of El Choco. And there's no highway and there's no airport. The only means of communication is the river. So to get to the town, you have to use the river. And so on December 20th at 5 a.m., the paramilitaries came to this town. So a lot of speed boats came carrying a lot of heavily armed men. So these men came into our town uh, through the police station. So the police station is the first building that you come to as you, as you pull up to the town in the boat. And so they got off their boats at the police station and from there they went out to the streets with their list in hand of people that they were looking for to kill. And the people that were that figured among those on this list were the community leaders and the leaders of this organization, leaders from the whole municipality, <coughs> especially those who had been involved in the struggle for the land titles. So since they came so early, a lot of the people, most of the people were still asleep, and they went into their homes and they dragged them out of their beds, um, and some of them were naked still because they had been sleeping, and they tied their hands behind their back like this and began dragging them through the streets naked. And anyone who resisted was shot right there in front of their family. And as they were dragged through the streets and, and as others went running through the streets, they were shouting and crying because they had never seen a situation like this before. And their cries and their shouts is what woke up the rest of us. I was still asleep at that time as well, but I was able to wake up when I, heard their, when I heard their cries and understand what was going on. So I also began to run out and look for a hiding, space, hiding place. So my town is sort of in the, in the form of an island because it has a waterway on the back side as well. And so many of us ran toward, that, toward the water and we, and we hid there. At 8 a.m., army helicopters arrived to the town and they began to fly over. And these paramilitaries who were on the ground were in radio communication with the soldiers in the helicopters. And they told the people in the helicopters that they should attack those of us who were running toward the river because we were guerrillas. So the army began to attack the people who ran back here with machine guns and by dropping grenades. In this process, the army and the paramilitaries killed many people. Many people they captured and took them alive and then we never saw them again. And those of us who survived were hidden in the water for three days. And after three days, we knew we had to get out because we were very desperate and, the, and we had a lot of anguish. But the town was still full of soldiers and of paramilitaries, um, but that was still the only way out, so we had to go through there anyway. So we decided to leave very late at night, and just by chance, by luck, the place that we crossed by, there was no one there. So I began to meet with some friends of mine and we began to meet regularly and analyze our situation and what our strategy could be for this organization we were thinking of forming. Nuestra estrategia para poder generar una organización o construir una organización 
And this was a process that took a while to identify the displaced families because many of the people who arrived did not want to appear as if they were displaced people because of the, because of the psychological impact that the war had had on them and the fear that they had. This is very difficult because those of us who work in the organization, sometimes when we leave the house in the morning, our families expect or hope that we'll be able to bring some food home at night. And oftentimes the only thing we bring home at night is our own hunger. Pero hemos creído que este trabajo hay que hacerlo porque de lo contrario muchas familias van a seguir sufriendo. But we think that we still have to continue doing this and carrying out this work because if not, we'll continue to suffer the same consequences. So if our sacrifice can help improve the quality of life for other people, then we think we're sacrificing for a very noble and just cause.